Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the fantastic Betty Gilpin to talk all about her series, Mrs. Davis. And I wanted to start by, by talking about some of the conversations that really informed Simone as a character for you, in particular in, in talking to some nuns ahead of time. And I love the fact that you've said that it kind of really challenged the expectation that you had going into those conversations and that you found this this group of wonderful people who are incredibly connected externally in their communities and have a lot of ferociousness to them which when we look at Simone she really embodies all of those aspects as well and so how did you find kind of certain threads between each of the conversations because they it sounds like they were also different um that really kind of tapped into some of the the details that you wanted to shape into Simone as a character as you developed her yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Mara. Um, I, you know, in approaching this character, I realized, you know, I think I thought, oh, um, in film and TV, we really stereotype nuns as either horror movie nuns or sort of these uh, meek cloistered beings. Um, and then as I got further into my research, I realized I myself had had really stereotyped nuns um, and that I had a lot of um, sort of untangling to do personally for my relationship with the church. Honestly, Um, I, you know, myself, I'm not a person of faith. So approaching a role where um, this character has an actual real tangible relationship and marriage with a guy named Jay who happens to be Jesus Christ. I was like, I don't, I don't know how to even begin that. You know, is it, is it, uh, and I asked Tara Hernandez, the the creator of the show and Damon Lindelof, you know, is it like dating the air or having sex with the ocean? Am I a human poem? Is he a human poem? Should I play it as such? And they were like, no, you are dating a dude who you're in love with, who happens to be Jesus Christ. And in talking to these nuns, um, I realized that wasn't really a gimmick for our show, that that is really what they feel, that they are in a relationship um, with Jesus Christ. You know, they don't see him face to face in a falafel restaurant, I don't think. Um, But, you know, their connection is very real and very personal to them. Um, And I think, you know, if there's any poetry to be found in it, it's not in a sort of, it's more in how it has made them be in the world. You know, I think that me navigating my own life creatively and, um, trying to be a creative person holding a screen all the time, basically, I feel like the separation between um, daily life and then finding stillness in my own brain in order to just be creative gets harder and harder, honestly, the more I scroll on my phone. And I'm finding, I found that nuns really don't have a separation between spiritual serenity in their minds and then the rest of their life, that they always just sort of it's like the screen door is always open in their mind and in their souls um, in this really beautiful way. Uh, so I, I try to incorporate that into this character. <laughs> so I, I, lo- I love what you were describing there about the conversations with, with Tara and Damon about this big ethereal idea of what a relationship with Jesus would be. And then the idea that it's actually this very intimate and grounded moment because your performance feels so incredibly intimate throughout the series. And yet the show is taking all these really huge swings in terms of what it's exploring um, in terms of the tone. I've heard you describe it as kind of no country for old Looney Tunes. And it is Mm -hmm. all of those (laughs) things at once. Um, And so did you find overall that as you went into scenes, it was really about thinking about the big picture and the big idea, but then really the the finesse of grounding it down to the more intimate spaces for you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's such a testament to the writing that even though it's a million genres being blended together and, um, you know, sometimes outrageous circumstances, but always with these themes that are so um, crucial to our daily lives uh, in real life, um, you know, And I think the scenes that Tara and Damon and the staff writers wrote, it was, it always felt 
100% real. And the map was right there on the page to stay grounded. It wasn't some turn of my performance that grounded the show. I think that it's really in the writing. Um, we just had to stay, say the words out loud, really. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for Simone, something that she struggles with um, or struggled with in her pre-nun life is the risk of loving someone and being loved by someone without the guarantee that everything's going to be okay. I think in her relationship with her mother and her father and with Wiley, you know, feeling, I think we can all relate to feeling this deep love for someone and having, you know, the six-year-old within you saying, I want to spend every second with this person and give everything to this person but then realizing, oh, they could die or betray you or go off on a personal quest when you need them most. Um, and that's all part of the vulnerability of human connection and loving someone. Um, and I think in her relationship with Jay, Simone was able to sort of compartmentalize that feeling and sort of sidestep vulnerability and risk in having proof constantly in front of her and being able to close her eyes and access this haven where everything was okay and she would be fed and loved. And while that is, while that was beautiful, it's not real connection and it's not real faith. If you have proof all the time and assurance that everything's going to be all right, you know, it's not letting you, the believer or the lover, uh, do any of the necessary vulnerability legwork. And I think that in, in the season, she sort of realizes, you know, she's only kind of a halfway nun, that Mother Superior has real faith and she needs to sort of disconnect from this constant proof and, um, you know, in, in doing so, learn how to maybe love other people correctly. <laughs> I mean, with bringing up her, her relationship with her mom as well, there's so many complexities at play in terms of who she is as a character, because there's both that, that sense of rebellion and trying to really pull away and to be a much more emotionally available person than her mother has been to her. And at the same time, there's facets of her deeply instilled because of that relationship, even the way that she calculates risk five steps ahead because she ended up shot by a crossbow by her mom when she was yes. a kid. Um, yes. And so did you find that that kind of similarly the writing on the page gave you a lot of those kind of push and pull dynamics of this is where she is exactly who she is because of her mother. And this is where she's really trying to draw and pull away from that idea as well. Yes. I mean, totally. That that was something. Another thing that was so brilliant about the writing that in Simone, you know, she has the bones of Celeste. <laughs> like She is raised by this. Um, a uh, brilliant engineer who, you know, told her there's an answer for everything. Everyone is trying to betray you. Everyone is trying to pull one over on you. Everything can be explained. Look, I'm, I made the strings that I'm pulling. Um, and uh, for her to have, for Simone to have this experience with Jay going against every fiber of her Celeste crafted identity. Um, I think you know, even though I may not have fallen in love with Jesus in my life, I have fallen in love. And I think that, you know, in doing so, or, 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 you know, becoming a mom too, I felt this way that there are things that happen that sort of tectonically shift who you are and make you go against every pillar that you thought was cement in your identity. Um, and I think that watching Simone sort of fall in love with aspects of the world and other people through her relationship with Jay, um, despite, you know, Celeste telling her don't trust anyone and uh, the world is a dark and evil place. Um, you know, I think we see that once Simone goes back out into the world to find the Holy Grail and to try to defeat Mrs. Davis, we see that, you know, it's not all hearts and rainbows in her mind. There's still lots of Celeste with her, you know, she's still got her middle finger up to a lot of the world, which is not very nun-like. <laughs> she has a lot of work to do in that area. 
she she's also a character that exists with um a lot of juxtapositions which makes her feel you know it's it's one of the many things that make her feel so fully realized as a character on screen you know she can be completely ferocious and fearless and at the same time absolutely terrified riding on the back of a of a motorbike and very <laughs> closed off emotionally in in one regard but then she has this incredible curiosity in the world and openness to all sorts of people around her um and so did you find that that opened up a lot of different spaces is to be able to play to in scenes when you get all these juxtaposing elements that are all very true within the same character. Yeah, I mean, you know, I found it, you know, the genre hopping and the sort of um, weaving in and out of, uh, you know, fists up or arms open. I, I all of that felt more grounded in reality to me than than the projects where you have to stick to sort of one tone and one uh, flavor of person or story. Um, you know, I, I think that oftentimes, sometimes I feel like, particularly for writing for women, although maybe men feel this way too in other other ways that sometimes I feel like it's either the hardened badass who can do no wrong and has all the answers or the sort of gee willikers, aw shucks, what's going to happen damsel um, in librarian distress. Uh, And I think that, you know, Simone slash Lizzie because of her past and upbringing and then her faith experience is sort of all of those things um and to me we are all all of those things um you know it's just like sometimes the log line is easier when you write a character one dimensionally but luckily we have pretty brilliant writers <laughs> i also wanted to ask about filming the scenes where simone has people talking as the proxy for Mrs. Davis, because she is never the one engaging directly throughout the series. And, you know, it it feels like there's always certain elements at play that are, that are very similar, no matter who the proxy is, because she's conversing with an AI and yet she's not able to fully remove herself from the fact that she's sitting in front of a kindergarten teacher or talking to someone who's holding a baby. And so there's different kind of intonations and and tone of voice at play in a lot of those different conversations and so I was interested in how you went into each of them a little bit differently yeah I mean I think that um part of what Simone has been hiding from in the convent is other people um you know she loves her fellow sisters um but I think she was telling herself she'd be happy if those were the only people she saw for the rest of her life. Um, And, you know, I think that is somewhat relatable. I think that in the pandemic, I certainly felt like that. Um, You know, I had a baby during the pandemic and I had some pretty extreme postpartum anxiety. And I was just in this sort of cocoon of safety, just me and my baby and my husband and sort of, out there became this scary, ominous thing. And it for a second felt like, oh, before this time, it felt like maybe 89% of people were inherently good and meant well. And then there was this weird 19% of people that were scary that I didn't want to see and couldn't trust. And I suddenly felt like, oh gosh, did the percentages flip? Like, are there now, is it now harder to find the good people and is it all scary and um, evil out there? (laughs) And I think that maybe Simone felt similarly that, you know, that she had felt this tiny little corner of the world that was beautiful um, and untouched by Mrs. Davis. And the the rest of it was just um, sort of uh, a lost cause. And now she has to go out into the world and interact with the lost cause and is realizing in doing so, maybe I'm the lost cause. <laughs> maybe I'm the one that needs to do the work, um, which is similar to what I found about myself going back out into the world. Um, and I think that, you know, the nuns that I spoke to, they're not hiding from the world in a bubble to try to white knuckle the last vestiges of what is beautiful. They're out there on the border they're on the front lines they're in their communities and they are actually walking the walk and connecting to just as much of the ugly as they are to the beauty of the world um and 
you know, I think that Simone, uh, in those scenes, I think it's sort of, it's like human connection 101, like <laughs> stepping, her, dipping a toe back into it. <laughs> And when when you're filming moments in the show where Simone is is visiting Jay, you know we we get to see her in a different physical location wherever she is before and after in a lot of those instances, and it's really beautiful to kind of watch the ebb and flow of her in a moment with Jay, and then what happens if all of a sudden now she's left him and she's sitting with Wiley, and how much mm-hmm. is still within her in that moment? Yeah. Um, but were there challenges that came with with kind of finding those aspects of what's carrying through in in between? between these two conjoining scenes and in these moments and even just that initial question of you know is it kind of fully emotionally the same place or is it a little bit different you know um the directors Owen Harris Alethea Jones and Fred Toy uh they were so they were so in it with me in terms of um tracking the arc and tracking just how real each of these connections were. I think we just started with connection every time, like with Wiley or with Jay and um, with Celeste. Uh, And I think it, it just made it so easy to connect the dots. And also like every single department on the show was so invested in all of these connections and themes that it's like, I could have turned to George the prop guy and been like, where was I in the scene before this? Like tearfully, he would be like, you were telling Wiley that you like, (laughs) it was uh, a real team effort. Um, But yeah, I think that, um, you know, Simone having sort of a feeling like, um, like, like one hand is out, towards the person in front of her being like, don't come any closer. And the other one is like reaching out. Uh, I think constantly that sort of push and pull of don't come near me. Oh God, please ask me a question. Um, Please love me. (laughs) It's hashtag relatable. And uh, you know, I think that every time she went to falafel, it was sort of like opening her heart a little further and further and further. And honestly being with Wiley too, I think that, you know, she tells herself like, oh, great. I have to team up with my ex to defeat this thing. And and I'm only next to him by force, but actually, you know, she loves him and loves being with him. And uh, I think like accessing a former joy of her former life um, is, is medicine to her. Yeah. I also wanted to talk a little bit in terms of spoiler territory, the the final episode, because we watch her, you know, become so fully invested in this absolute quest. And then we get to watch her experience finding out that Mrs. Davis was an AI created for Buffalo Wild Wings as a, a customer interaction piece. Um, and that really just strips away a lot of things and completely recalibrates everything that she's been journeying on for those several episodes. And so for you, what what was kind of the the big shift that you wanted to feel within her as a character and how you felt that was re- really recalibrating a lot of things for her? Yeah, um, uh, I think that for Simone, she had this very specific idea of who Mrs. Davis was that. Um, you know, she was this, it was this evil, ominous other, this supercomputer that was trying to take us over and destroy our connections to beauty and to Jay and to the inexplicable and everything she had come to love about the world, a world that she never thought she would love one drop of. Um, And I think she thought in defeating this other evil, maybe there's a chance for the beauty of the world to thrive. Um, And I think that in her mind, these two things were outside of her, that Jay and Falafel were outside of her, uh, something she could access and that Mrs. Davis was this other uh, outside of her. And in realizing that it's not this ominous Hal-esque supercomputer, that it's an app for Buffalo Wild Wings and just sort of a dumb robot puppy wanting to give us wish fulfillment. And then realizing 
also, oh, I'm not going to have access to falafel anymore. It's sort of a parallel realization that, oh, it's all up to us that faith is generated from within and how we use this robot puppy (laughs) is up to us as well. Um, And I think that is a terrifying realization for her, A, because, you know, her faith, she's realizing, um, has never not been proof-based that, uh, you know, she doesn't have the faith that Mother Superior has where she doesn't need tangible proof all the time. Like, you know, I don't know that Simone knows that she can continue a relationship with Jay without falafel being a constant sort of haven. Um, so she's sort of day one of faith sobriety. And I think that that probably is a very tempting time for her to turn to a robot puppy in your pocket, giving you whatever you want now that she has this vacuum in her life. Um, but you know, it's similar to how I think of AI in our lives, but it's, it's up to us how we choose to use it and it's us. I don't trust. (laughs) Um, so probably we should cut it off (laughs) also so often when you're playing a character in a tv show there's so many ways in which you can really use costume to kind of chart that journey but for this you're really relying on a singular costume for the majority of the show and then it's not really until that final episode that we suddenly suddenly see a complete 180 of of what that looks like externally for her to be wearing a bucket hat and just completely different clothes. Um, (laughs) And so how did that create a different aspect in terms of the external relationship with a character when it's more about a singular costume, but then being able to have a moment like that in the final episode? Yeah, it really felt, um, I mean, it was, you know, being in the Lazarus Shroud and then that costume, it just sort of felt like we had entered another dimension, Um, like we were filming the last few episodes in space. Um, You know, the crew were making fun of me because they were like, this is the first time I've seen your wrist. (laughs) Like, oh, yeah, you've only known me as a nun. Um, But no, it it really felt, uh, you know being out of her habit too, it it felt like these little faith tests for her of like, are you still a nun? If you don't have, uh, if you don't have the props, if you don't have the set, (laughs) like, uh, you know, it has to all be Simone generated. Um, but Susie Coulthard, our, our costume designer was so brilliant. And so, um, it just really pays off when everybody is so, miles deep invested in story and the backstory for every single little tiny, you know, uh, pen on a desk. Um, it just all went so deep. Um, and I think that is the success of the show, just every department coming together with extreme passion. (laughs) And when, when you were filming that final moment with you and Elizabeth Marvel, where her mom is is acting as the final proxy for a conversation with Mrs. Davis. Um, what were a lot of the important emotional beats for you going into a scene like that? Because I think there's something so beautiful about watching there be an element of reconciliation in the relationship, but not pretending that it's going to be perfect. You know, you're in yeah. essence having Simone say, I don't need you to fix everything. I just need you to be by my side. And there being an understanding that hasn't existed between the two of them their entire lives. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I think that I don't know that they could just sit and have a conversation, the two of them, without some outside purpose uh, that they could pretend was the re- the only reason they were sitting together. Um, you know, I think having this proxy and Mrs. Davis in her ear allows Celeste to say certain things and allows Simone to receive and say certain things, um, you know, and only Beth Marvel could have weaved in and out of that. It was, it was amazing watching people, um, you know, most proxies, uh, most people who played uh, the proxies for Mrs. Davis were only given two pages of the whole script um, and didn't really know what the show was about. One woman thought she was playing a hologram um, and thought so until after she wrapped her scene, she was like, I've never played a hologram before. That was so fun. I was like, Oh, you were in a hologram. Never mind. Um, you did great. <laughs> uh, but you know, it was so, um, 
it was really beautiful to see a lot of the similarities between all these actresses who were trying to help their scene partner with the quest that they didn't know what it was, but also trying to navigate this robot talking to them. Um, uh, but yeah, that scene, you know, I think that um, her Celeste processing the Lazarus Shroud is real. Jay is real. The whale was real. You know, all these things that her brain is telling her cannot possibly be real. <laughs> um, but just that she loves her daughter. And I guess I'll just have to accept these things if I'm going to tr attempt to build a relationship. But I think uh, I really appreciated that the writing we're not in the epilogue, you know, like these are two people who are sort of day one of loving each other, trying to love each other and day one of living in this new world. I don't like when characters have sort of magically come to these epilogue conclusions off screen and now they're, you know, 100% healed. I think it's uh, eliminating Mrs. Davis, part of eliminating having a robot puppy in your pot pocket giving you all the answers is going back into the unknown and the vulnerable and risk. So I think watching Celeste and Simone kind of swim in those uncomfortable feelings, um, the reason for being alive, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's such a great scene and I really, really loved your performance throughout the entire series. Um, it's so great. So I really appreciate getting the chance to talk to you. Thank you so much, Betty. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mara. <laughs>